Great to be with you all tonight. My name is Matt, and I'm the chef and co-owner of the Arcadian and Haymaker Bun Company right here on Bakery Lane, just like Chris said. The uh, workshop that we're going to be doing tonight is potato gnocchi, and uh, hopefully everybody has received the video um, detailing how to boil and prepare the potatoes in advance of forming the dough. So everyone should have something that looks similar to what I have in front of me. I'm doing mine with 10 potatoes because it's easier for you all to see and we need it for the menu tomorrow. But uh, everyone should have two potatoes worth of, of uh, prep in front of them. If you don't, um, chime in in the chat and we have a few minutes here where we can hopefully walk you through the steps to catch up. Um, so that you don't miss out, miss out on the opportunity to make gnocchi today. Uh, for everybody else, we are um, we're working on gnocchi, and in Italian, gnocchi just means dumpling. So you can make gnocchi out of pretty much any kind of uh, soft food item. Um, potato is probably the most common. You can make ricotta cheese gnocchi. You can make them out of a vegetable puree like beets or celery root, carrots. Um, in each case, you're just adding uh, flour to sort of bind the soft food into a dough, an egg to kind of help it all stick together. Um, and the end result is a little pillow of, uh, of potato goodness that is really, first of all, it's a great year round pasta. Um, we've had them on the menu here at the Arcadian all winter and are kind of pushing into our new spring menu uh, with more gnocchi. So, We've got some sauce recommendations that were also part of the, uh, the email package that you all received in advance of the class. Um, for people who have never had gnocchi before, we always recommend just cooking them in boiling water and sauteing them with a little bit of butter because that gives you a chance to kind of taste them naked and on their own. Uh, so if you've never done gnocchi before, this is that's kind of where I would start, but I'm happy to talk more later on about the, the sauces that I'd recommend. So. Uh, hopefully everybody's in a good spot for us to get going on the dough. While I've been talking, the, the potatoes in front of me have been cooling down a little bit. It's really important to use a wood cutting board. If you don't have wood, then a regular plastic cutting board will work as well. But the wood kind of helps to wick the moisture out of the potatoes, and moisture is the enemy here. So anything that we can do to make things as dry as possible that's going to mean that we don't have to add as much flour later on, unless flour is going to give us a lighter taste to your pasta. So with your cooled spread out potatoes, hopefully they've dried out a little bit. There shouldn't be any more steam coming off of them. I'm going to start by adding your Parmesan cheese. If you don't have a scale at home, I know the recipe I think had some weights on it. We weigh things here. If you don't have a scale at home, not a big deal. The, the ground rule of gnocchi is that you're just sort of dusting everything with enough ingredient to cover it. So all this Parmesan cheese is going to go on top. The next thing we're going to do is season the gnocchi. So I have salt, pepper, and nutmeg. If you don't like nutmeg or you don't have it and you don't feel like going back out to the grocery store just to buy nutmeg, just leave it up. Question that. Sure. Um, is the towel method for peeling just for speed, or can I peel before boiling? Well, that's a great question. If you could repeat the question. So uh, the question was, in the video, I peel the potatoes after boiling with a towel, and um, the question was, can we peel the potatoes before boiling them, so that you don't have to wrestle with a really hot potato coming out of the water? It ties back to the. Uh, what I was just saying about water being the enemy. And if you cook a potato with its skin on, that skin is like a little bit of a uh, raincoat for the potato, for the starch inside. So that starch can't absorb too much moisture. If you peel it beforehand, the outer layer that's in contact with the boiling water is going to get kind of waterlogged. It'll still come out fine. You just might have to add a little bit of extra flour, which is why we recommend uh, cooking it with the, the skin on. We have another question. Sure. Can find if you don't have Parmesan cheese, can a different kind work? Can Absolutely. Can you use a different flour other than all-purpose flour? Two yeah. Questions. So um, the two questions were, can you substitute something else instead of Parmesan cheese? 
and uh, would a different flour work? And the answer to both questions is yes. If you have a different cheese, I would recommend a hard grating cheese, so Pecorino or Romano or uh, something in, in the hard cheese realm. Um, softer cheeses would also work, but they might kind of uh, uh, make the dough a little sticky or um, require a little bit more working to get things uh, to come together. So pretty much any cheese, but uh, Parmesan or Pecorino would be the two that I'd, I'd recommend the most. As for flour, we use all-purpose flour. Um, we've done these gluten-free before with a cup-for-cup gluten-free flour, which kind of performs just like all-purpose does. Um, the good thing about gnocchi is you're not looking for a lot of protein um, building, a lot of gluten. Uh, you're looking for the opposite. So a gluten-free flour uh, tends to work pretty well. You could use cornstarch if you were in a pinch, uh, and that, that might work too. It might be a little bit gummy, but feel free to try it with anything. So we'll go, uh, go ahead and season here. Again, the answer to how much is just enough to, to cover the whole rectangle that you have in front of you. If you felt like doing a little bit of cayenne pepper for a spicy gnocchi, that would be a great thing to substitute for the traditional nutmeg. If you want to just do black pepper, that's fine. If you don't like black pepper, leave it out. The salt's important though. I would de definitely not skip the salt because that's going to bring a little bit of flavor into the pasta. That's hard to get later on from just cooking it in the pasta, the salted pasta water. Don't skimp on the salt. Okay, so we've seasoned evenly across the whole top. The next thing to do is going to be the eggs. And I have one egg yolk per potato. So in my case, I'm doing 10. You should have two at home. And there's two different ways to do this. You can mix the egg yolks up a little bit beforehand, or you can just pour them in whole. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do them whole. Just try to spread them out. <clears throat> Break them up. So, before I start mixing this, we have to talk tools for a second. And in the recipe, it calls for a dough scraper or bench scraper. Uh, that's this thing. It's a piece of wood with a piece of metal stuck to it. Um, if you don't have one of these, I'd recommend getting one because they're a pretty good tool for a lot of things in the kitchen. If you don't have one tonight, don't worry. Uh, a metal spatula, a stiff metal spatula that you have for pancakes will work great. Um, you could also substitute Let's see, uh, a knife would work too if you're, ju you're just trying to kind of chop things in. So a knife or a spatula would be the two things that I'd recommend using if you don't have one of these. If you do, you can go ahead and start chopping everything up. So because we haven't added any flour yet, the goal of this stage is just to make a, a loose mix where we're kind of bringing the egg in <clears throat> But we're not trying to homogenize it yet. We're not trying to make it all the same. Because when we add the flour, we're going to do a little bit of kneading. And at that stage, we're going to take this dough, which might have pockets of potato or pockets of yolk, little bits of cheese all over the place. And we're going to kind of uh, bring it all together as a dough when we add the flour. <clears throat> Gluten develops during kneading, so the less kneading you do for this dough, the more tender your pasta will be. Which is why before adding the flour, we're doing a little bit of sort of pre mixing <clears throat> I'm just trying to get all the really liquidy bits of egg yolk mixed in. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to mention your question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Okay. Can, um, 
the question is, can you just mix everything in a bowl or can you mash it that way? Can you mix everything in a bowl? So the reason that we we start by spreading it out flat is to vent the steam and to kind of cool everything down and work with it in a flat layer. Um, when we mix the dough, we're kind of folding it over itself instead of kneading it in a bowl. Um, if you were short on counter space and you know the, the bowl is your only option, I'm sure it would it would work, but uh, we would definitely recommend kind of working on a flat surface instead of inside of a bowl. Um, so after you've got your, your pre-mixing done, again, you can still see big pockets of yolk and potato. It's not all the way mixed yet. We're gonna take the flour. Very important at this stage, the recipe that you have in front of you calls for twice the flour that you need. The reason that I do that is because a lot of times people cook their potatoes after peeling them and they need a lot of extra flour or, um, you know, the, there's variance in how much uh, moisture is in your egg yolks. It's good to have extra, but don't put it all in at this stage. Put half in. So, I weighed mine out to half because I've got some extra hiding underneath me. So I'm going to add all of this. And the way that we do it is just like with the Parmesan and salt and pepper, dusting it all the way in a nice, heavy, even layer over the top of the rectangle. The goal of the flour is to just bring everything together. If you add too much, the dough will dry out. If you don't add enough, the dough will be sticky when we're kneading it, and you can, at that stage, add more, and you should. But it takes a little more working to get the dough um, back to dry if it's running sticky later on. So this is your best bet to, to get your flour in correctly. So after I've sprinkled it over in a nice, thick, even layer, sometimes I'll just take my fingers and kind of work it in gently. So you should see this sort of pebbly looking dough. Okay. Sure. Can you repeat that? Uh, should we put in all of the one and three quarters cup of flour? The recipe calls for one and three quarters cups. I would I would add um, about three quarters of a cup to start. So now that we've got the flour in, we're going to start bringing this together as a dough, and so. We'll use a book analogy because it's a uh, part of the library series. We're going to take that first third of the dough that I just folded over and fold it into the middle. Next, we're going to take this second third and fold it over into the middle. Folding allows the dough to kind of mix. It's like you're making biscuits, you're mixing the dough together and homogenizing all the ingredients without doing a lot of kneading. So then the bottom goes up to the middle and push down. Top goes back towards you. Push down. And so after four fold overs, we took something that was really crumbly and made it dramatically less crumbly. This is about halfway. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same thing again.
after you've done the folding method a few times, you can start working it with your hands. And what I'm doing here is just kind of folding it back towards me and pushing down and away from me. Rotate. Bring it up towards me and down and away. So I'm being pretty gentle with it here, trying to bring it together into a nice smooth mass, but not working it too hard. I think that during this class, I sometimes scare people by saying, you know, if you over knead the dough, it's going to be tough and terrible, and that's, that's not the case. You know, feel free to bring it together and to use your muscles on it and, you know, work it to the to the point where it turns into a dough. But if you've done everything else right up to this point, it shouldn't need too much kneading and mixing to come together. And we're gonna be rolling this out into logs. And so sometimes when I'm finishing the kneading stage, We'll start rolling it out a little bit just to kind of start what's going to turn into the, the shaping of it. So, stove came together pretty nicely. You can see that it's not sticking to the table at all. I can move it around without any kind of um, dough stick. That would be a sign that you need to add more flour if that happens. But if it was running really dry, I'd have a hard time bringing it together into a mass. The um, trick if you have dough that's running dry is to, if it's running just a little dry, sometimes the first thing I'll try is washing my hands and then not drying them and just coming back to the dough with the water on your hands. And sometimes that's enough to bring it together. If that doesn't work, try that another two or three times. If that doesn't work, you might need to add an extra egg yolk, but that would be surprising. So sometimes just that little bit of water is going to give you the, um, the hydration that you need to bring it together into a nice, nice dough ball. So once you've got that done, this is a good time to let the dough rest a little bit and you know because we didn't work it too hard it doesn't need a lot of resting time to be rollable but a little bit of resting time is going to get us a chance to wash our hands clean the board off and then come back and do the shaping so i'll leave this here the best uh thing to cover it with is just a clean clean towel at this stage hang up there. This is a good time to um, chime in with questions if you're having a hard time with your dough or want to talk about gnocchi. Let me know what's, got, what's on your mind. Everybody feeling good about it so far? So the question was um, talking about sauces. It's a great time to talk sauce. So if you were cooking this at home for dinner tonight, 
while your dough is resting would be a great time to get a quick sauce together. The two that we included are both um, appropriate right now. So I think the first is a Pomodoro sauce, which is one of the simplest, lightest tomato sauces. Again, the idea is not to mask the gnocchi with too much extra flavor and the, the tanginess of a, a tomato sauce that's not cooked at all. Uh, goes really well against the richness of the dumpling. So it doesn't get any easier than, than Pomodoro sauce. That's just uh, garlic cooked in some olive oil until it's soft with a can of San Marzano or plum tomatoes added to it and uh, put in a food processor until it's sauce consistency. Super easy, a little salt and pepper. Um, the recipe that we've been doing a lot at the restaurant, which is probably my favorite way to have gnocchi, is uh, with a cheese sauce. So we're using this Orb Weaver Creamery Frolic cheese. Um, Orb Weaver is obviously a local cheese making operation right here in Middlebury. And we're psyched to have found this cheese because it reminds me of an Italian Taleggio. It's a soft, ripe, uh, washed rind cheese. And we do that with a little bit of radicchio, heavy cream, and the cheese and just let all those uh, simmer in a pan until the cheese is melted down, cook the pasta, and then throw it in, toss it with the sauce. Super easy. And then the other recipe that I included on the, um, the notes was a ramp pesto. And we're a little ways out on ramp season, but if you do uh, have some wild ramps growing in your, your backyard, making pesto out of the leaves is a wonderful springtime treat. And ramp pesto is a wonderful sauce for gnocchi. If you don't have ramps, any kind of pesto, uh, basil or otherwise, works great as well. So those would be my sauce recommendations for tonight. Again, don't hesitate to try the, the plain butter. And you know, if you have a couple leaves of sage and you want to mix the sage in with the butter while it's warming up in the pan, that's a wonderful way to do it too. So versatility uh, on this pasta is tremendous. Like I said, you can, you can find a sauce in all four seasons for it. Um, another reason that we like doing a workshop with it is you don't have to use any kind of fancy machinery. There's no hand crank pasta machine that's in your basement that you have to dust off and, and locate. Um, it's just something that if you have it up your sleeve, you can pull off without too much um, in the way of equipment. So it seems like a, an easy one for people to pick up and add to their arsenal. So yeah, if you had, uh, if you're looking to do sauce at home, like I said, this can rest for five minutes, it can rest for an hour. Um, longer than that, you'd probably wanna move it to the fridge, but you know, for the um, for the time being and the sake of this class, we'll say, uh, you know, five to, five to 15 minutes is good. Um, as we're rolling out, we're also gonna talk about cooking. And if you are planning to cook these tonight, now would be a good time to put a pot of boiling water on or a pot of water on the stove and set it to boil. That's going to be one of the two things that you need. The other thing is a, a saute pan that has your sauce ready to catch the pasta as it comes out of the water. So those two things. Um, the cook time on a gnocchi is about three to five minutes. There is an old uh, bit of advice that sometimes people come up with that as soon as it floats to the top of the water, the pasta is done cooking. And um, that's kind of been proven not true. The dumpling needs to cook all the way through for all the egg to set and the pasta to hold its shape. So uh, if you're somebody who's heard that as soon as it floats, it's done, Make sure you, you stick to the three to five minute rule. Take one out of the water at three minutes and, uh, and make sure it's cooked all the way through. You'll see the difference between the cooked texture and the raw dough texture. We can go over that in more detail as we're shaping. So now that we're on to... Go ahead, Chris. Uh, there was also a question about how long you need How? How long? To need. Oh, uh, the question was for how long to knead, and the answer is just long enough to bring it all together into a cohesive dough. Uh, where before we're seeing big pockets of yolk, big pockets of flour and potato, now it all kind of looks homogenized. It all looks like one thing. So um, 
when you get it to this stage, it's generally when you stop needing for that rest. So, hopefully clean your board off a little bit. You don't want to have any uh, dry crumbs or anything for this stage. Friction with the board is important. So sometimes people will throw a lot of flour down on the board at this stage to um, <clears throat> help them roll the dough out, but it actually winds up hampering your, your rolling because you lose all the friction between your, your surface and your, your dough. So <clears throat> I cut a piece of the dough off and have just started rolling it out into a snake. I start with my hands in the middle, roll back and forth. And as I'm rolling, I work my hands out to the outside. When I get to the outside, I start back in the middle again. If you're uh, working with limited counter space, I would cut the, the portion smaller for rolling. I have the advantage of a long table here, so I'm doing a bigger snake. I generally recommend um, rolling this out to about the thickness of your finger. That's a good measuring stick. Um, when these are in the water, they're going to swell up and grow a little bit. So if it looks like a small bite size to you going in, it's going to be a um, large bite size coming out. So when I'm doing this here at the restaurant, I'll go ahead and roll all the snakes out and then cut them all together. So I'm going to do a few more. Uh, let everybody at home do the same. And while I'm rolling, <clears throat> let me know if you're having any issues with the dough. And we'll try to troubleshoot it together. This is feeling sticky to you when you're rolling it out. That's when I would add a, a little bit of flour just to keep your hands clean. Clean your hands before rolling, and they should stay clean. If the dough is sticking to your hands, add a little bit of flour, but try not to add so much that you're, uh, you lose your friction. have kids who like playing with Play-Doh, this is a wonderful chance to get them to cook you dinner. And really the rolling is just about the shape. You could tear off little chunks of this and ball them up and it would work just as well, but this is, uh, this is how we do it. This is how you make cookie.
do one more for now and then have something to play around with later. So, um, speaking of having some to play around with later, one of the things that uh, always comes up with the gnocchi is what if I make too much or what if I'm not ready to eat it tonight? And there are some options. So once we've finished shaping the dough and you have all the gnocchi into little individual pieces, you can place it on a sheet tray and throw it in a freezer and hard freeze it. Once it's all hard frozen, you can take those individual pieces of pasta and put them into a freezer bag or Ziploc or a Tupperware or whatever and hold them for you know a week or two, let's say, in the freezer. You have to give them a chance to freeze flat so that they don't stick together, um, which is what they will do if you just throw them right in in a bowl or something. If you want to cook these ahead of time and not eat them right away, you can, after they come out of the boiling water, dunk them in a little bit of ice water and that'll stop the cooking. Strain them out of the ice water and then have them just ready to be sauced later on. Um, or you could cook and sauce all of it and throw whatever you don't eat in the fridge for leftovers. Okay, so now, that I have these five snakes done. I'm gonna roll them all together, but at this stage, they're starting to, they're not sticky, but they will stick together if I roll them up against each other. So this is where I'm gonna take some of that extra flour and do a pretty, pretty thorough dusting. Too heavy. But you do kind of want to coat, coat the outside of each snake to take any sticky spots off. <clears throat> You don't have to do it this way. You could go ahead and roll one, cut one, roll one, cut one. That way works fine too. But this is generally the most efficient way to do it if you're if you're feeding an army or um, you're making a big batch. So. so cutting is next. I like to use a knife because at this stage um, I just want to go through the the five uh, rolls really cleanly. The dough scraper or spatula, or what you were using before as your straight edge, would work fine too. And I'll generally make these about a knuckle long, so I'll put my finger on and line the knife up with my fingertip and cut down. So that way we get even sizing. Even sizing is really important because when these go in the water, you're going to be cooking them all for the same amount of time and you want them to all come out done. I'm trying to make them as even as possible.
Okay, so sometimes I'll bring a little bit more flour back on. So when I loosen them up, they all separate. Just confirm that nobody uh, nobody stuck to their their buddy during the cutting phase. And at this stage, you've made gnocchi. You, you can stop here, throw them in the water, and eat dinner. No problem. No problemo. But uh, I think a lot of people probably have seen the traditional shaping exercise for gnocchi, where there's ridges on one side and a hollow thumbprint on the other side. And I guess the old story goes that 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 design helps to fold the sauce onto the pasta a little bit better. So there you go. But if you want them to look like that, we're going to go over that next. So don't worry. These guys did get a little sticky. A little extra flour would help. But they're fine now. Okay. So shaping. This is a, a new keyboard. It has ridges on it, piece of wood. And that's a traditional tool that you'd use for this exercise. But if you don't have a new keyboard at home, don't worry because a good old fashioned fork works just as well. So I'm going to show you with the board first and then with the fork. So you're going to grab a pasta. Try to center this for you. Push down with your thumb to make the thumbprint. Roll it off away from you to make the ridges on the back. Push, roll, push, roll. Almost like you're trying to bring the top and the bottom together to roll them off. Okay, that's the board. Fork is the same thing, use the back of the fork. Push down, pinch off. Push down, pinch off. So this definitely uh, it gives them an extra little bit of detail. Certainly some ridges for your sauce to stick into. belly button underneath but again these plain pillows are totally fine to just cook and eat as they are that's how we do it at the restaurant so that takes you all the way through the boiling of the potatoes the ricing of the potatoes making the dough resting the dough shaping the dough cutting it and then rolling it off a fork if you want. Happy to answer any questions at this point. Happy to talk more about cooking. Um, but let me know what you guys think. you're feeling proud of your gnocchi at the end of the class and you wanted to uh, put your picture up on Instagram or put a picture up on Instagram, I'm happy to, uh, to include it on our story. We're always proud of uh, students' work. 
people take the class. And happy to know that there are people out there in Middlebury who can call if, if our pasta maker gets sick. to ask any questions. Let me know if you need to see anything again. So after rolling them, I don't need the friction on the table anymore. And there is a little bit of surface moisture on these snakes so that when I bring them all together to cut them all at once, um, having a little bit of flour in between them helps them to not stick together. And when you take the gnocchi and cut them all and have them on a cookie sheet or, uh, you know, I'm going to grab a big sheet tray after I finish these, um, having that, that surface flour on them buys you a little bit of time um, so that they don't stick together. It's quite possible that you have a dough that's dry enough that you don't need to do that. And you know, that, that's kind of a feel thing, but if you do feel any kind of surface moisture or stickiness, a little bit of flour will, uh, will help you out. Did that answer your question, Amy? Um, another question, would you say it, uh, it is best only to cook what you'll be eating right away, wondering if they get gluey in the fridge? You know, as a cooked leftover, it'll get a little gluey, um, but certainly fine the next day if you're, you know, you're going to eat them the next day. If you're, if you know that you're not going to eat them right away, I would, I would recommend freezing what you're not going to use and then having them right from the freezer into the boiling water is the, is the way to do it. So don't think that uh, if you have them in the freezer that you need to thaw them first because that'll make them kind of come back with some of that, that condensed uh, water on them and they'll stick together at that stage. So throw them right from your freezer into the boiling water, cook them for the same three to five minutes, maybe a little bit on, closer to five minutes from frozen. Um, but that would be my recommendation if you're, if you're trying to get two meals out of one batch. been a wonderful weather week this week so we're full steam ahead on our plans at the Arcadian to open the restaurant back up to in-person dining this Thursday, Friday and Saturday and then we're going to go to a four-day week next week so we're looking forward to hosting guests again and putting food on plates um, after uh, winter's hibernation here. Um, 
So, if you're not happy with how your gnocchi came out tonight, come on in and we'll make one for you here. question was about using other ingredients instead of potatoes. And the ratio of egg to other ingredients is, is generally the same. So if you look on the, um, the recipe that I gave you, I can't remember the weight of the potatoes off the top of my head, but you would match that same amount of other uh, wet ingredient, whether it's ricotta cheese or a vegetable puree, um, you know, a, a mashed uh, pumpkin or butternut squash um, would work well. And that ratio of flour to egg would, would stay the same. What would change is the flour. And that's really a feel thing because there's such a wide gradient of, of hydration in the the other ingredient that you'd be substituting for the potatoes. We know that Idaho potatoes are relatively dry inside, starchy potatoes, and um, you know take this much flour. We also know that things like sweet potatoes or mashed butternut squash are much wetter, um, so that you're probably going to need close to twice as much flour for those for those preparations. Um, with regards to ricotta cheese, what I would always recommend doing is, if you can, um, leaving it to, to drain overnight in a colander um, so that any kind of excess moisture comes out. And again, that's gonna translate into the smallest um, addition of flour necessary and the best pasta. So whatever you do, just try to get it as dry as you can. Question here about cheese stir oil. I guess it should be stir oil. I guess she's wondering. Oh, yeah. I mean, the um, the pastas are finished at this point, so they're ready to go. Um, if you needed, you know, 10, 15 more minutes of sauce making, for instance, you could leave them on a nicely floured sheet tray maybe give them a shake every couple of minutes to make sure that they don't start sticking on you. But um, yeah, at this stage, they're ready to cook, they're ready to boil, three to five minutes, make sure you check one. Make sure that your pasta water is adequately salted. That's something that we really do uh, try to make sure that people realize is that it should be salty like the ocean when you're, when you're cooking pasta and that's gonna help flavor that pasta so that it's super tasty when it comes out. Uh, it depends on the sauce. One thing that we generally try to uh, say as a rule of thumb is if you cook the pasta you know, 80 to 85 percent in the boiling water and the last 15 to 20 percent in the pan, that, that's a good rule of thumb because that starch is going to leach out into the sauce that you're making and kind of help it stick to the pasta. 
Um, Gnocchi are a little bit fragile in that sense, so you know you m might want to take it closer to full cooked, and then just have your, enough sauce to to dress it with ready in the pan, and have it be relatively quick, um, coming out of the water into the sauce. If you've cooked it all the way in the water, it shouldn't uh, shouldn't take too long in the sauce. Um, but again, that that's kind of a variable based on how much sauce you put in your pot, how saucy you like your gnocchi. Um, we generally would say between, um, for this batch, if you're cooking the whole batch, I would say you know, a cup to two cups of sauce would probably be enough to, to get it done. But if it's tomato sauce, it's gonna be different than pesto sauce. If you are doing the pesto sauce, what I would recommend doing is taking the pasta out of the water and landing it in a little bit of pasta water. So take, you know, take a quarter cup of pasta water out of the pasta pot Put it into your saute pan, take the pasta out, cook it in the pasta water for a minute with a little bit of olive oil, and then add the pesto just at the end so that the pesto doesn't lose its color to, to overcook it. Because when you've got something with a fragile green color like pesto, you don't want to uh, cook it too long. All right, well, thanks to Welcome. And thanks to everyone for joining. Bon appetit. Well, we have one more question here. Okay. Um, Fiona, did you, Fiona, did you have a question? Um, oh, here we have one more question in here. My yogi sort of turns to mush when I took it out of the boiling water. Was the dough not dry enough? Turning to mush usually means undercooked. Um, the question was, a gnocchi turned to mush, um, taking it out of the water. That generally is a symptom of um, undercooked pasta because the, the egg, um, the cooking of the egg is what's gonna really pull it all together and let it hold its shape. Um, and so if, it, if it's, melting that badly, I would say you probably need to just get it a little bit more cooked. Okay, and one final question, and then I think we'll end for the evening. If you don't have any sauce, what, how should you keep your gnocchi? Is butter good? Butter is great. You know, like I said in the beginning, if you're, if you're new to gnocchi and, you know, you're, uh, you don't have any sauce hanging around, then just melt a little butter, um, mix in a couple tablespoons of the pasta water with the butter once it's melted, season it with a little salt and pepper, um, take the gnocchi out of the pasta water, move it into the butter and water, toss it to coat it, add a little bit of Parmesan cheese. If you have fresh, fresh sage, that's wonderful on there too. And enjoy that one. <laughs>